Welcome to another episode of the NEI Podcast. I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel, live at the NEI Congress 2019. It's day three, and we are here with Dr. Citrum for an extended Q&A session. Let's listen in as he addresses your unanswered questions from today's presentation. In today's session, I covered eating disorders, and we had several questions. So let's expand on these and clarify some concerns. The first question was, does bariatric surgery work as a treatment for binge eating? Actually, bariatric surgery will fail if someone continues to binge eat. So it's very frequent that bariatric centers will screen for binge eating disorder in order to avoid this from happening. And patients will need to be treated for the binge eating disorder prior to having bariatric surgery. Another question was, what pharmacological intervention would you suggest for clients who still struggle with evening or late night binges, even on Vyvanse? So this is a question that requires some consideration of what the dose of the Vyvanse is, and it may be not optimal for that individual person. Let's say they're on 50 milligrams in the morning, perhaps they need 70. So this is one of the things I would try first. And it could be that they are not responding adequately to Vyvanse and we would need some other approaches. The other consideration is, uh, have they had a course of cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy? Uh, And if it's accessible in your community, it should be offered to them. A question was raised, and how do you categorize and address binge eating without distress? Well, part of the DSM criteria for binge eating disorder is the degree of distress or the presence of distress related to their binge eating. So without that distress, it is very difficult to make that diagnosis. And they would have an abnormal eating pattern that doesn't fit the mold of binge eating disorder. Another question is, if Prozac helps with bulimia nervosa, would Luvox be a reasonable second option? Well, Prozac, fluoxetine, is an approved agent for bulimia nervosa. Uh, Luvox uh, has not uh, been approved for that purpose, so you would be on your own. It would be an off-label use. I wouldn't be surprised if it would be helpful for some patients, but we don't have as much data as we would for fluoxetine. A person asks, I have many patients who have concurrent depression or bipolar disorder along with the binge eating disorder. Seems to come from so low self-esteem and self-soothing. Please tell us your thoughts on this. Well, it's very common for people with binge eating disorder to also have concurrent psychiatric disorders, such as depression, or perhaps bipolar disorder. I find that treating the depression or the bipolar disorder will not necessarily eliminate the binge eating disorder. In fact, many patients with successfully treated major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder persist with binge eating disorder, and they need additional treatment for that, regardless of their success with Uh, decreasing their problem with self-esteem that we can do quite successfully with treatments for depression doesn't seem to make a huge impact on the binge eating behaviors for many people. An audience member asks, what is an easy way during the psychiatric interview to assess what is an amount of food larger than most people would eat in a similar period of time and circumstances? Well, one way that I address this is in the review of systems when I ask a patient if they've had any changes in their appetite, if they lost or gained any weight, I ask them the key question, tell me, when we're talking about food, have you ever eaten more food than you would have expected to eat and you lost control over what you were eating? And if they answer yes, I would want more details. You've already introduced the idea to patients that you're asking about their appetite, and you've expanded that to their loss of control over what they're eating, and it would be a quite a logical point then to ask specifically at that time, what exactly are they eating, and to quantify what they're eating. Most patients will, will do that, and it's not like you ask them out of the blue this question. You did ask it after a sequence of other questions that led to this one. This is similar to another question, specifically how do you ask the questions in your patient's visit to tease out binge eating disorder. I make it pretty much a routine when I assess people for their sleep and concentration and appetite. I just include it in part of the appetite section of my general questions. I ask everybody, you know, have you lost or gained weight? Have you noticed a change in appetite? And oh, by the way, when we're talking about appetite, have you ever eaten more than what you had planned to? And did you like sort of lose control? over what you're eating. And that brings out uh, more details about their eating behaviors that possibly may indicate binge eating. 
If I don't ask those questions in that way, they won't tell me. We get the question a lot. Can you assume that a morbidly obese person likely has binge eating disorder? Well, no, you can't really assume that. A binge eating disorder actually can strike anybody, whether they're underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. Now, morbidly obese people have a higher likelihood of binge eating disorder than someone of normal weight, but certainly not a guarantee that they have binge eating disorder. You will want to know about their eating habits, though, and it may not be that they've lost control over the quantity that they're eating. It's just that they are eating more than what most people would eat, but they don't have that distress over what they're eating. They don't feel guilty afterwards to the same degree that a person with binge eating disorder would have. So the associated criteria or symptoms that a person with BD would have as listed in the DSM would be very helpful here in distinguishing someone who uh, eats more than they should and is morbidly obese versus someone who's morbidly obese and also has binge eating disorder. Similar to that question is the question, are most of the BD patients obese in your experience? So I would say in my, my own uh, practice, most of my BD patients have been overweight or obese, and they presented themselves for treatment at a eating disorder specialty practice and referred to me for their psychiatric care. So they've already self-identified as a being having a problem with, with binge eating and, and and weight issues. But there are lots of people in the community who have binge eating, do not realize that they have binge eating, and are younger and of normal weight or maybe just a bit of overweight. And they don't know that binge eating is a disorder. They may see it as a personal failure on their part to control their food intake, and they have no idea that this is something that is treatable. So I would say if we do a outreach for people with BED in the community, uh, maybe they will appear in our practices earlier on before they've gained a lot of weight. A treatment-related issue is, given the mu opioid signaling involved in binge eating disorder, what role does or could naltrexone play in treatment? Well, this has been looked at with uh, not much consistent success. I've also tried it in my own practice, but it's not just a matter of opioid signaling. Uh, there's also a impulse control issue as well. And so it's more than just opioids. We also have to deal with dopamine and norepinephrine as potential targets for the treatment of binge eating disorder. So this has led to some disappointment looking at those treatments uh, like naltrexone for BED. A question that sometimes comes up is the relationship, if any, between nocturnal impulsive eating and binge eating disorder. If the nocturnal eating involves eating a large amount of food in a short period of time with a loss of control, as well as distress about it, and associated with the symptoms outlined in the criteria for BED, then we would say this person has binge eating disorder. The last question is also treatment related. What are your thoughts on treating bulimia nervosa with both fluoxetine and listexamphetamine to help stop binges and improve impulse control? This is not an unreasonable um, consideration. I would want to take a close look at the uh, warnings and precautions included in the labeling for fluoxetine and listexamphetamine to make sure that that patient doesn't meet uh, any uh, conditions that may restrict this combination approach to be used, but it, it appears logical. Well, thanks so much for joining us on this podcast. Uh, enjoyed very much presenting on eating disorders and answering your questions. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for the next extended Q&A sessions from NEI Congress 2019 and make sure to subscribe.